Despite producing more leaders in the nation since independence, the North remains poverty-stricken. The question is, why? And governors past and present intensify plot to hijack control of the APC and the PDP. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacone. Elder statesman Alhadi Tanko Yakasai has said that other regions in the country blame Northerners for their problems when the North has the highest number of poor people. Despite having ruled the country longer than the South, the North is said to have a higher number of out-of-school children, higher poverty and illiteracy rates, especially with the Almajari system. Well, joining us to have this conversation, we have Alhaji Shehu Musa Gabam. He's the National Secretary of the Social Democratic Party. And of course, we're also being joined by Salihu Tanku Yakasai. He's a special advisor to the governor on media in Kanu State. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. My great pleasure. Thank you. So I'm going to start with you, um, Yakasai, of course. The elder statesman is related to you. But then um, <clears throat> in the past, some Southerners have accused uh, the North of plans to dominate the seat of power over and over again and um, leadership positions, making it seem like it was their birthright. But um, there has been other cases where the North has seemingly been in opposition to the restructuring that has been banded around over time, especially when it's close to elections, uh, and people feel that they do this because they benefit more uh, from the system that we are uh, experiencing or going through right now. But really, is that the case? Is the North really against the restructuring of the country, or is it that they have different reasons for opposing um, the system of government that we are asking for? Well, I think uh, uh, in your, to answer your question, there are a number of things that you, you put together and uh, presented as well. You know, we have the issue of the, uh, so many leaders that the North have been able to produce, and then vis-a-vis -vis the level of uh, the economic situation of the people in the North uh, is not uh, in tandem with what uh, is attainable in terms of the political leadership. And then you have the issue of the restructuring that you asked, which is an entirely different uh, issue. It has nothing to do with uh, the first uh, topic that you highlighted. But to answer your question, which is the, on the issue of the restructuring, I don't think uh, anybody is uh, per se afraid of uh, restructuring uh, because the, 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 there is need for everybody to be able to look at what is being presented in terms of restructuring. Up to now, uh, uh, this case has been met several times by a lot of people a lot of um, leaders, that is, what are we asking for in terms of uh, issue of restructuring? Nobody has been able to put forward uh, their demands in terms of uh, what they need to be restructured. You know, everybody is just uh, more or less beating around the bush. So there is need for people that are agitating for restructuring to be able to define what it is that they are talking about in terms of uh, the restructuring. There's also the issue of the legality of how this restructuring is going to take place. The only and uh, the only way that any amendment to the constitution can be done is through the National Assembly. So if you are proposing any other platform which the restructuring cannot take place without amendment of the uh, constitution, so if you are proposing any other platform that will discuss the issue of restructuring outside of the legal institution that is the National Assembly, which is assigned for, for amendment of the Constitution, then you see you are going into a legal lacuna because who has, who has, who, who has given any other body the mandate, the constitutional mandate to talk about uh, or to, 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 to carry out restructuring because this will involve constitutional amendment. You have to touch some aspect of the Constitution for you to be able to restructure any part of this uh, entity called Nigeria. So there is need for people that are agitating to be able to convince the rest of the country 
that these are their lines, these are their proposals, and it has to be channeled through the appropriate channel, which is the National Assembly, okay. uh, through the constitutional amendment process, uh, which is the only legal institution that is allowed to, 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 to tamper with the constitution or make amendments, uh, of course, after passing through the state assembly. So I think they need to, those agitating need to be able to put this forward for the rest of the country to know what, what their plan is so that at least the rest of the country can have uh, their own uh, input as to how uh, the structure right. can take place. I will, I will come will back, be, I will uh, come back to you, Mr. Yakasai, but let me go to Shehu. Um, from 1960 to 2015, in no particular order, we've had several leaders, again, I reiterate, from the north, starting from Tafawa Balewa down to President Muhammad Buhari, uh, who's the sitting president. But then the records, I gave a statistic um, when we started this conversation, there's so much um, illiteracy in the North. There is um, um, a high number of out-of-school children. Uh, there's high poverty uh, rates, actually, as we speak, and I especially the Almagerie system. So I'm, I'm trying to ask, what exactly is wrong with the North? <clears throat> what exactly is responsible for the snail speed of growth in the North as compared to other regions of the country? Being that there are several leaders coming from out of that region, it should be shown in the way of life of the people and the growth uh, rate in the north. But so, if that's not happening, the question is what's responsible for that snail speed growth? Well, first and foremost, let me, let me correct you poverty uh, is a general problem in Nigeria, it's a general problem in Africa as a whole, it's not just particular to northern Nigeria. I've traveled to all the state of the Federation of Nigeria. So I have a pulse of the level of poverty that is affecting every state of the Federation of Nigeria. Number two, wherever you see massive poverty rate that is taking uh, the, the entire environment, it is a failure of a, a very correct policy that can take care of the situation. The policy of the government over time and over time have isolated the basic principle that deals with the education of an average citizen of Nigeria. The cost of education in Nigeria is extremely very high. The government was unable to liberalize the educational system to accommodate families that cannot afford to pay uh, for their children's school fees and create a system they can create some sort of empowerment for the parents to be able to afford and send their children to school. And in the North, there are two systems of education. Before the Western education, we had an Islamic system of education, which is virtually in every household in Northern Nigeria. And they communicate through that, that, that system alone. You don't just have to be uh, educated through Western education for you to be educated. Uh, you know, lack of Speaking English is not a definition of illiteracy. But the poverty was high because the population of the North is also very high. And the policy to deal with that population, to create a job or create a, a develop a skill that mm -hmm. will accommodate these citizens was absolutely very, very low. Majority of the those that are in power, including the governors, have no priority in giving a massive, uh, you know, priority to accommodate these children that are roaming the street, or also to empower the parent to be able to accommodate or send their children to school. So it's a failure of policy. It's I, a failure of priority from I, both I, the federal I, I'd government like to come and in. the state governors as well. So I'd like, like to, I have said, I'd like to come in there, if you don't mind. You said it's a failure of government, but there seems to also be a responsibility on the part of the parents. There's Planned Parenthood Federation of Nigeria. I mean, this is everywhere in the country where parents are told how many children they can have. They're helped to plan for the future because this affects um, their livelihoods one way or the other. Of course, the government has failed in their duties, but where do the parents come in here? Because you have to have a sense of responsibility. Having children that you can be able to take care of? Or does, does religion step in here and play a role? So you know the, the thing that we say in Nigeria that children are a gift from God, so you can have as many as you want. Could that be part of the problem? Well, you have, you have said it all. You know, our African system 
have to do with culture, have to do with religion, and have to do with other factors that, you know, culminated into uh, African people giving birth to as much children as they could. So, but with the modernization, with the modern challenges that is uh, making people deficient in ability to take care of themselves and their family, I think individuals are beginning to understand clearly that they need to give birth to children that they can train. When you take aside the issue of theology out of the whole discussion, it is natural for people to begin to understand that when you give birth to a number of children that you cannot control, there are also consequences that you have to pay for. So in as much as it is, it is a normal thing to a decent person to, to train his own children without shifting blame to others, it is also incumbent on the government to develop policy and program in view of our history, our past as Africans, to ensure that there are programs that are well articulated, well defined, mm -hmm. that can take care of these children and that will take away poverty from the street. So it's a policy program. It's a failure of policy from the shapers of the policy. Like Yaka say have said, there are constitutional issues. It is human beings that produce, that frame the constitutions. And it's the same human beings that can amend this constitution in the overall national interest of the country. Okay. And it takes nothing to amend the constitution, provided the executive have the interest to amend this constitution in line with the, with the, with the governor supporting the process. It will go through, it will be amended. The land use act will be amended. And of course, every state in Nigeria, particularly in the North, can take care of themselves, can take care of their system because there are, there are a lot of embedded natural resources, you know, in every state of the federation that can take care of their population. But this policy cannot work except the constitution is being amended and the processes okay. are being respected and the stakeholders have the interest of ensuring that the constitution is amended for them to have the impetus to All do right. what is necessary. All right, I'll come back to you, um, Mr. Shehu, but let me go back to Mr. Yakutai. Um, the elder statesman, when he was addressing a group of people on this issue of the North being very poor, he mentioned that um, as much as Northerners have been in power, it does not reflect in, you know, how much is being done for the people in the northern region. He said out of the eight people who are very rich in this country, only two come from the north. Now, I don't want to believe that it's about wealth per se. Let's look at the leadership in the northern part of the country. Now, you have started with, you know, the basics saying that there has to be a political will. But if we have had precedents, because we're quick to say that power at the center, oh, the president didn't do this. We're very quick to point fingers at the president. But what about the grassroots level leadership? What about the local government chairman? What about the state governments? Have they led well? Can we say that they've done their jobs well? And when we look at the statistics coming from the north, because there are other issues in different parts of the country, but that of the north is very alarming, even though... Um, Mr. Shehu is saying that poverty is everywhere, but I do believe that the statistics we have in front of us tells the truth. Well, I, I, I have to agree and uh, to some extent with uh, what Shehu has already started um, itemizing on the issues or the genesis of why uh, we are, the, the poverty rate is as what it is. I also agree with him to a large extent that the issue of poverty is not just... Uh, uh, peculiar to northern Nigeria alone, you understand. And uh, to address that, I think it's not about uh, the, 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 lack, the leaders that we have in the north who have been failing the region in particular, but we've also had leaders from the south. We've had, uh, uh, for instance, we've had Obasanjo that has been there for eight years. We've had uh, Good Luck Jonathan that has been there for five years. Go to Bielsa State. Bias the state that was created, I think, at the same time with was it Jigawa State. Go and see the difference between the two states. You know, Jigawa is far better than Bayelta State, despite Bayelta State taking uh, 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 oil revenue, you know, and, and other sources of revenue. So it's not, uh, to, 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 to put it mildly, you know, we have terrible leadership across board, and that is affecting uh, every, sec every section of the country. <clears throat> And where the problem is, is that the reason why we have high rate of poverty in the North, I think for me, is uh, the issue of uh, lack of education. You know, the level of education in the North is not is nothing compared to that of the South. And this one, to address this one, to, to understand this one, 
you have to look at where we are coming from as a country. You know, of course, we all know that the colonial masters and the missionaries started from the South, and then and that has helped the South in terms of their level of education. It, it isn't much of a government thing, to put it that way, you understand? It is because of those, these two factors that has been able to influence the level of education in the, in the South, while in the North, just like Malishio has said, we have a large number of people that are educated Islamically, which is now more or less not being considered as a formal edu- as a system of uh, uh, education. You understand? So these are the things that we are looking at. And if you look at the economic viability of the individuals in the in the in the south, it's not the same as those in the north because in the north, predominantly, <clears throat> our main source of uh, 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 earning a living is farming. And we have all seen since the coming of crude oil in this country, we have all seen how farming is taking a back seat because uh, 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 it's not being done in a, in a large scale that can be able to, uh, to, to become an economic tool in the and, country as well. And, and why, so why is it not being farming, done in large uh, scale? The world all over, in fact, the likes of um, um, Singapore and Asia, in fact, let's talk about Southeast Asia, they are maximizing agricultural potentials out there. And we are supposedly an agrarian country, especially the North. Why are we not taking advantage of all of the technology and all of the facilities and information that's out there to grow our agriculture? Why, is it, why are we still backwards in that regard? Because, because of the failure of governments. You know, subsequent governments have, been, have not been able to mechanize farming. It is not a, it's not a question of uh, a lack of uh, farming tools or the ideas or the seeds, you know, that uh, these people need to produce in large quantity. But it is the lack of government policies deliberately targeting uh, large production, in, including issue of value addition to the system of farming in general. That is what has been failing the people. And this one, you cannot say it's just... Uh, a northern leadership problem because, we've, like I said, we've had a number of southern leaders that have been there that have not uh, taken Nigeria to the next level in terms of agri- uh, agricultural uh, uh, <clears throat> level. So the failure is that of the government in general. It is not uh, uh, of honor because as long as we cannot be able to uh, uh, engage in irrigation farming, all year round we wait for the rainy season to come that's about four or five months in, in, in average. We do not engage in irrigation because a lot of the, the, the most, majorly the governments are not uh, putting more efforts in seeing that we cultivate, cultivate our lands all year round. And this is affecting uh, the production level as, as it is. And as, as, again, the lack of electricity is also hampering on the manufacturing <clears throat> sector, which is also by extension a uh, 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 value added uh, sector in terms of agriculture. So all these factors are all being uh, put together to undermine the development of agriculture, which is predominantly uh, affecting the north as a region uh, against any other thing. Can I ask, can can I come in quickly before I go to to Mr. Shehu? You are obviously working in a government and you have been saying that, you know, it's failure on the parts of government, but you work in a government, you work with the Kano State governor, what is your government doing in this regard? All of the things that you've stated and laid out as some of the problems that are being faced in the North and leadership-wise, what is your government doing to change that in Kano State? We are, do- we are doing a lot. Uh, I can highlight some of the few things we are doing, but I'm sure the time will not be enough for me to highlight all that we have done in agriculture. But let me give you a few examples. When the governor of Kano State came on board about five years ago, the the rice that we cultivate in Kano is just about, uh, I think, 400,000 metric tons. And today we are producing over almost close to 2 million tons. So you can see the increase in terms of the rice production in Kano state. The wheat production has also increased dra- dramatically. Production of a tomato in Kano state has increased. We, all, we, we have uh, alleged Dangote. We had to come to Kano and set up a tomato factory just because uh, production of tomato has increased in the state, and the mechanization has also been uh, introduced into it. But like I said, 
is just five years into his administration. Five years is not enough to turn things around. <clears throat> you understand? You have to build on what subsequent administration has done. There has to be continuity. You understand? Because he came and met basically nothing on ground. When he came on board, the, the fertilizer blending company of the state was not operational for 23 years. Huh. He was the one that revived it. And today, that fertilizer company is supplying fertilizer to neighboring states, not just Kano. We don't have any problem with fertilizer in okay. Kano. In fact, we are getting urea from the federal government, uh, to, as, uh, from Morocco to the federal government, for this company to, to be in preparation. So in terms of what we have been doing is enough, is, is, is good, is commendable, but it's not enough. There has to be continuity. At okay. least when the next government comes in after Gambuji, we want to see continuity of this uh, 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 positive strike. <clears throat> okay. But not right. just in Kano State, but in other northern states, if you want to fight poverty, All you right. have to be able to modernize uh, agricultural sector in the region. Let me take it from there to Mr. Shehu. Um, just picking up from where he stopped. Government, of course, we say is a continuum, but we fail to see that happen over and over when governments come and governments go. Um, we keep talking about leadership failure, but what about followership? Mr. Shehu, you ran uh, as a vice presidential candidate on the ticket of the SDP. Um, what changes do you think that, or what would you have expected from the people? Because I'm now talking about followership. How have the people in the northern region been able to hold their leaders responsible? I'm not talking about just when they come and campaign. And we know what the campaigns look like in Nigeria. It's not necessarily the people asking questions. It's about people coming to say, I'll give you roads, I'll give you rapper, I'll give you money. Um, what is the role of the average follower, the average citizen in the north, in terms of demanding for good governance, for good leadership, and the de dividends of democracy? Is there any such thing so far? And have they been putting governments on their toes? Well, the greatest weapons against any citizen anywhere in the world is poverty. The moment you weaponize poverty, people will find it extremely difficult to exercise their right or their franchise or to complain because you have weaponized poverty, you have silenced them, their inability to react or because they will be coerced or they will be intimidated. Naturally, you will find out that people are following the system very, very blindly. But I can tell you that the system is changing. Revolution is coming up very silently. Unlike before, in northern Nigeria, if one person have, have issues, have spoken, have issued a statement, they will be just like, oh, yeah, let's go. But it doesn't happen anymore. People are challenging their leaders. They are calling them to order. They are voting against them. So, so there's a revolution that is coming up. But in terms of how strong Policy. is that revolution? How, how powerful is it? Because, you know, there can be a it, movement, it, but if it, the movement is not strong enough to, to withstand the establishment, I, then it will just I, be, you know, uh, one of those things that happens. I, I can tell you clearly that the revolution is very strong, it's very powerful. I piloted one of the revolutions that unseated a governor, and we brought in a government, and up to today is what is functioning in my study. In Bochi State. Once we have a governor that is not performing, the people of Bochi will vote him out. Certainly, there is no debate on this. So you, you have to enlighten the people. You have to bring their consciousness to understand their right, their fundamental right to vote, and that their fingers matters. If they vote person, the uh, uh, wrong person, which means they have to fast for four years. They have to wait for four years to change that person, except if the Oh, I think we um, have a little person issue. become incapacitated. Let, hello? Yeah, we have let, a little issue. Let, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, let me go back a little bit to some of the statistics you have generated. I've been to Singapore and I and I and I and I've studied the, the, the their capacity, the vision of the leader who led Singapore into what it is to the 21st century uh, country. I've also understand the, the pattern and the, the way the South Africa have is, is going outside uh, uh, the late uh, president of South Africa. So it's an African issue. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of sickness that we have in Africa. And the feeling of the leaders is that once the citizens are being empowered, they will be rebellious against the leaders. Mm -hmm. Unless these mentalities are being changed, that empowerment of people is strengthening the power of a nation. It will make right. the nation more viable, more economically uh, attractive for investors, 
and so on and so forth. But in the environment that we live today, the moment you are being uh, or you are acquiring some sort of muscles economically and so on, the system will start haunting you. This is this applies to all African countries. Unless the Africans change their mentality and allow the economy to grow for the betterment of the citizens of the entire Africa. Northern Nigeria as, 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 as a whole is a fundamental block and we have everything it takes to develop. There is no okay. reason for poverty in Northern Nigeria. The moment okay. restructuring is allowed, the Northern Nigeria will go to every level every society is looking forward to. Okay. Governors will be held accountable. They will develop their infrastructure in the state because they will develop resources to deal with the citizens of the state. So these Thank are you. about policy issues and allowing the policy to function. Thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Yakasai, Mr. Shehu. Thank you for joining us live on this conversation. We will continue to talk about the North in subsequent uh, shows, of course. And as you are in your different uh, states, you obviously will be working to make sure that you change the statistics coming from your region. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for Thank you. Me. My great pleasure. Thank All you. right. Well, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about past and present governors. Yes, they're all working together to hijack the APC and PDP party leadership. Stay with us when we come back.